Hello everyone. In this video, I'm going to show you how to do a very basic bouncing ball in Maya. Before we start animating, I want to be able to set a few preferences in Maya to help us with animation and to kind of make sure that when you're following along that you're going to see the same thing that I do. So if you go to Window, Settings, Preferences, and Preferences, you're going to see a couple things that say animation. So I've got this one and it talks about ghosts, which I can talk about in a future video. And then these settings down here for animation. What I usually do is I change it from weighted to non-weighted tangents, right? So that's in this first animation section, right? There's a lot of other settings that I'll go through in a future video, but that's what I want to set up for right now. And then I go down to the time slider. And in the time slider settings, I want to make sure that the key ticks are set to smart. I believe by default it's set to active, but make sure that's set to start. And then I'm going to make sure the sync timeline display is on. It's usually off by default, and this one is on by default. But I make sure both of these are on sync timeline display and sync selection in graph editor. I want to make sure that auto snap keys is set to on. And then the playback speed is set to play every frame. The max playback speed is set to 24 frames per second times 1. And if you look at the top, the reason it's saying 24 frames per second is it's set to 24. And then I'm going to scroll down and make sure that the update view is set to all, not active. Active is usually the default. And then I'm going to go ahead and click Save. And that'll save those preferences. I can't just close the window, but I'm going to click Save. Another way to get there is if you go to this little running guy with the uh, little gear, if you click that, you can go right to the time slider settings and change the time slider settings and then change other settings. So that's a quick way to get there. Again, you have to click Save after you make changes. Don't just close the window. Go ahead and click Save. Right. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to right click on the timeline and I'm going to go up to playback speed and make sure it says play every frame max real time. Setting these settings will make sure that it's coordinated with the object when I'm animating, as well as being able to set tangents on this that you'll find as I move throughout this video. And just to kind of point this out, I'm going to kind of play this through and show you this. And I have an editable motion trail here in Maya that I'll show you how to use. And it shows the path of action for this bouncing ball. So this is a very typical exercise for traditional animation, 2D animation, 3D animation, to illustrate a lot of different principles of animation. So uh, this is something that quite often animators will do from time to time to kind of demonstrate a couple principles. So I'm going to kind of walk through it and show you how to set it up. And I'm going to stop this and show you that I can turn off this editable motion trail. I can just hide it by entering 0 for the visibility. And I'll kind of show you this. And I'm not going to create the same, the exact same animation here. I'm going to be embellishing upon uh, a new one. So I did this one as an exercise before, and I'm just showing it as a demonstration as to what I will accomplish in uh, this, this video. So I'm going to break this video into two parts, and I'm going to do the basic setup in the first part of the video, and then in another video, I'm going to refine it, which is very typical. You want to kind of start it out, block it out, get it kind of moving, and then start to refine it. So we're going to kind of start from there. So the first thing I want to point out is I made a project for this. And if you don't know how to set up and create a project in Maya, I have a video that goes through that and check that out and make sure that you're kind of going the right way. So I'm going to go ahead and open scene. And while I've already set my animation, I've already created a project and I've already set this project, but I'm going to set it again just to show this. So I click set project. And then in the set project window, I'm going to choose my folder, which is this animation bouncing ball demo. I don't have to go into the folder. I just click the folder once. I select it and click set. It sets that folder as my project folder. And it takes me right to the scenes directory. And if it doesn't, I can just click scenes here and it goes right to it. So I'm going to select this file that I created. I created it earlier, but it's just a basic default empty scene. This right here is the rig file. And I want to make sure that's in the scenes directory because I'm going to reference that in my animation scene. So the idea here is that this file will be referenced inside this one, not imported, but referenced so that it always points back to this rig file. And both have to be in the same project. Right. So if I'm creating a whole you know, series of scenes and creating a scene file for each one, 
I can reference that same rig into each one. And if I make a change to that rig file, every time I open the scene, it's going to update to the new changes of that rig. So it's a great way to work. It's almost essential when you're working with multiple scenes, as well as you don't want to animate on a rig file directly. If that's your only rig file and all of a sudden you start putting animation in it, then you have to delete all that animation and get rid of it. So to point this out, that rig file does not have any animation in it at all at this point. So I'm going to select my scene file that I've created and open. And I'm not going to save that. I already did. So you can see it's just an empty scene. There's no other geometry, no models, no rigs, whatever in this scene. So uh, the first thing that I want to do is I want to make sure I'm going to rotate this this way. I'm going to reposition it and then dolly into that. And you can see that y, the Y axis is up and X axis is to the right. So I, I want to do that because I don't want to animate back and forth. I'm going to rotate it this way so that my animation is going from left to right in terms of the X axis. So I have my grid set up there. I want to add a floor to this because I don't want to use the grid as my floor. If I ever end up rendering this, it's not going to look like I have a floor at all. So and I want the ball to bounce onto a floor. So what I'm going to use is just this polygon plane. So I'm just going to click that once and I have interactive creation on. So it means that I'm going to just drag on the grid to create it. Now, if you have your basic default Maya set up with not without interactive creation turned on, when you click that, it's just going to create one in the middle of the grid, and then you can move in and modify it. So either way you go, it'll work. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go to, I'm in the channel box here, and I'm going to go to these translates, and you can see that there's a little movement here. So a tr movement in the X and the Z. So I'm just going to zero those out, drag across those values, enter zero, and then hit enter, and it'll accept it. And it's going to center it in the grid. So you can see it's centered, and I'm going to go to the attribute editor, and if you've never seen this before, these are all nodes that go to make this object. So you have a transform node, which is this first one. This first tab is a transform node. And you can see it has different values. And that's just how it's placed in the scene. The second one is a mesh node, and that's just how it renders. That's the mesh inside of it. So transform doesn't care what's inside of it, but this does. This is what's going to render. The original construction history, this polyplane node, is what is originally creates the object. If you ever delete the construction history, that node is going to go away and it's going to be just combined into this other node, this mesh node. So this, I can still modify how that original object was created. So I'm going to change the height and width to 20 so that it's a 20 by 20 square. And you can see that I can just automatically change that. I can also scale it up, but this is my preferred method before I, you know, kind of delete the history. The next thing that I want to do is I want to reference in my rig that I have. And I make sure, again, it's in my scenes directory. I'm going to go over here to the outliner. I'm just going to right click without anything selected. And I'm going to go to reference and create reference. What this is going to do is it's going to open up this reference window. And in the reference window, it looks like a file open window or you know a save dialog box, but it's where you select a reference. And in this case, this rig is my reference. It's this ultimate ball rig. So I'm going to reference that, and it's going to place it in the scene. So when you look at it over here in the outliner, you're going to see these little blue diamonds. And what that means is it's reference. It's always going to be pointing back to that rig file. So if you get rid of the rig file or you delete the rig file, it's not going to load anymore. It's not imported in the scene. It's just referenced inside. So it's always got a link back to the original one. So the next thing I want to do, because I want to be able to drag across these controls and select them, you'll notice that I'm also selecting the floor when I do that, right? So I don't want to be able to do that. I don't want to be able to select that floor and move it around. Once it's placed, I'm going to leave it and lock it down. So there's a couple different ways I could do it, but I'm going to actually go over to the channel box. And I'm going to go down here where it says display. This is a really great way to hide or you know, just reference what it's called referencing your objects in the scene without being able to select them. So this last button over here, when you hover over it, it'll tell you create a new layer and assign selected objects. So I've selected the floor, and I'm going to click that button. And when it does, it creates a layer. It puts this inside that layer. And you can prove it by going to this first one that says V, that's visibility. And if I select that visibility, it turns it on and off. It hides it, shows it, and hides it. So it's visible, it's invisible. 
This last one, I'm not going to talk about this middle one, but this last one, if I, it's a toggle, it's a three-way toggle. And if I click it once, it's going to show T. And that's a template. And you can see it's an outline, but it doesn't actually show the geometry, which is sometimes helpful. And if I select off of it, and I can go to the layer and press it again. It's going to go to R, meaning reference. It's referenced in that layer, right? So I can't select it. I can drag across. And if I click it again, it's empty and I can select it. So it's a great way to kind of lock things down or hide things or just make them a template in the background when I'm working on some animation. So I'm going to select this placement controller of this rig, this ball rig. And we're going to look at the attributes over here. It's in the channel box. I can see the same thing in the attribute editor. It's just easier to see what's keyable in the channel box. And it's got translate, rotates, uh, which is very typical. But then there's some stuff at the bottom. And at the bottom, it says ball type. And right now it says basic. I can switch it to simple. I can go to football. So this one's got a lot of capabilities in it. And some rigs just do that. And if you use a different rig, it might have some different capabilities. This one allows you to switch the, the skin of the ball. Also, it has this one thing that says extra controls. And I have them on. And what that does is it adds these two little controls, one at the top and one at the bottom. And I'll demonstrate what those do later. The next thing I want to do is I want to take this placement this uh, control down here at the bottom, press W on the keyboard, and I'm going to move it over here where I'm going to start the ball bouncing. Now, this placement controller, it's only just to move the ball in a starting position. I'm not going to use it to animate at all. I'm just going to set it there, and I'm going to leave it alone. Now, if I ever want to move my animation around at some point in time, like I don't like where it's bouncing, I can kind of reposition that. But I, usually what I do is I set it, and I leave it. Not all the time. There are some times when I'll move it. But in this case, I'm just going to leave it right there. I don't even need to key it as long as I don't move it. And then I'm going to select the center ring around this ball, and I'm going to move it up. And then I'm going to press S on the keyboard, making sure that my playhead is on frame 1. So I go to frame 1, and I press S on the keyboard. Right? And that's usually the method. Go to the frame that you want it to, where you want the key, move the, uh, or position your rig, and then press S on the keyboard. Right? So if I, you know, decide to, I'm going to move this ball over here, and then I'm like, oh, but I want to put this on a key, and I click on it, it's going to go right back because the previous key is determining where its location is. So really, when I set a key, it's setting a value at a certain point in time, right? So right now, at this point in time, the translate Y, the up and down, is set at 7.353 on frame 1. If I go to frame 20, let's say I bring that down, and bring it over, right? And I'll set it down. And I'm actually going to just zero out this Y because I want it to be right on the ground. In this particular rig, when I do that, it sets it so the ball is sitting right on the ground. It's just zeroed out there. So with that selected, I'm going to press S on the keyboard. And you can see they all turn red. And I've keyed the X value. So I'm going to go forward. And actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to shift and click that one key. And I'm going to move it back some. I'm going to move it to frame 15. Now, I can do other things with it, but uh, I'm just kind of setting it so that it uh, that I want that key at frame 15. Just wanted to set it there. And it also shows you that I can move it, right? So now I'm going to go to frame 45. And I'm going to just move my ball over a little bit and press S on the keyboard. And I'm going to go about halfway before that, move the ball up. And I'm going to move it over just a little bit and press S on the keyboard. And now it should be you know, sort of floating in between those two. So it doesn't so much look like a bouncing ball yet, but sort of a balloon that's floating around. So then I'm going to go, I'm going to go to 75. I'm going to move it over. Again, press S on the keyboard, go about 60. I'm going to move it back just a little bit and up a little bit. And then I'm going to go to frame, I'm going to go to frame 100 and press S on the keyboard. And I'll go about here. And I'm changing up my timing just a little bit. And I'm going to move it up and press S on the keyboard. And I'm going to go to this last one. And I'm going to move my the ball over here. And I'm going to press S on the keyboard, go about halfway. And again, I'm going to be changing my timing. So and I'm going to bring a ball up just a little bit and press S on the keyboard. And now when I play it through, I have a ball that's moving. I've just animated the ball. But it looks more like a balloon that's dropping uh, and floating around. Now, I, I have some issue over here somewhere where it's just kind of going up and down. And I'll fix that, and I'll show you how to fix it. And kind of sort of did it on design so that I could show you how to fix it, right? 
So what I'm going to do now, there's a lot of different ways that I can modify this motion and change this motion. One is using the uh, graph editor. But at the start, what I'm going to show you is a different technique just to kind of start out. And I'm going to go to the visualize menu, right? If that is not there, go over here and make sure you're on the animation menu. If you're not, if you're on something else, just switch to animation, then go to visualize. And I'm going to create editable motion trail. And I'm going to go ahead and click that option box. In the option box, you'll notice at the very, there's a, quite a few options that I'm not going to change. But it says start end for the time range or time slider. And I'm going to base it on the time slider because I want it to go from frame 1 to frame 120 in my time slider. It also has increment, pre-frame, post-frame. Don't we need to worry about those. But if I switch it to start and end, I can set it to the start and end frames. But I'm going to switch it back to time slider. And then I'm going to go down and change this to show frame numbers. I don't need to worry about the trail thickness or the key size, but I do want to make sure it's set to always draw instead of draw when selected. So those are the options I'm going to choose. I'm, I, I could click apply, but it would leave the window open. If I click create motion trail, it'll apply the motion trail and close the window. So apply will keep the window open and add the motion trail. Clicking create motion trail will create it and close the window, which is what I want. So when I do that, you can see I have a little bit of a path of action. It's not perfect, but I'm going to fix it. So I'm going to go to frame 15, right? And you can see that the ball's not on the ground. So I did some stuff that kind of changed it. So I could actually select that key and I can drag it down if I wanted to, right? And then I can drag over here and notice I added some bizarre frame over here. So I'm just going to right click and I'm going to go to delete. And when I delete it, then that key is gone. So this is a quick way to, you know, edit your keyframes. So I'm going to select this one. That's frame 30. And I'm going to bring it up. And the concept here when I'm animating a bouncing ball is that it loses momentum as it bounces, right? And that's not just the speed that it's bouncing, but the height of each bounce. Usually what it is, it's an exponential drop off. But if it's about half or less than half of the previous bounce, and we consider this to be the height of the previous bounce, then you're about right. So I could go a little bit less. It's usually a little bit less each time, but about half of each. And the same thing here. I want to move these over because each bounce should be less than the previous one, not half. I'd say about two thirds. You know, it, it, you really have to kind of judge what the ball is made of. You know, there's a whole a lot of factors in, in what's going to determine how it bounces and where it goes. So, and then I have this thing going on here, right? So I have a frame 100 and I'm going to just select that and I'm going to move it over, right? And since I dragged around it, I dragged both. And so I'm going to undo and I'm just going to click once. And that looks like I highlighted 75 because I turned on the frame numbers and I could see 75. So I'm going to move that over. And then I'll just click off of it and click on this one and then move that over. So now I've got these other, you know, now I've got them separate. So I made a mistake earlier in terms of setting two keys where they on the same spot. And now I've got them fixed. Now I've changed them. So I can kind of space this out just a little bit more and get kind of an idea of a, you know, a better spacing for my keyframes and sort of the ball bounce. And then I can just kind of click and drag on each one and move them. Now, if you end up doing what I just did and kind of click on a box and move that around, it might be okay, but I just move it back and forth in the X because that's all I want to do is move it back and forth. The ball is just sort of linearly going like this, right? So, and then I'm going to move that over just a little bit and down because I want that to be a really small bounce. And then bring this over and I'll bring that over, right? And so I have a pretty good, you know, drop off for each one. Maybe this one could be brought back just a little bit because I, I don't want that to be a very big bounce. And I'll bring this one down just a little bit. So I'm just kind of adjusting where each bounce is going to go. And then I'm going to play it back. And again, I have a pretty good path of action. But again, it looks more like a balloon that's kind of floating up and down than a ball that's hitting the floor and, and uh, bouncing. So if you don't know much about these principles of animation and how it hits, uh, I'd highly suggest you kind of look up the 12 principles of animation and look at slow in, slow out, and squash and stretch. And those are the concepts and the principles that I'm going to be bringing into this bouncing ball. So I'm going to kind of get a little bit closer so I can see this. Now, 
The big problem is here is that it's floating. You can see that it kind of starts to change its trajectory when it gets to here. And really what the ball needs to do is drop like this, right, for each one. So there's a neat trick that you can do with this editable motion trail and I can right click. If it does that, just kind of right click on it again. It just means it's not right on top of that little keyframe right there. And then I'm gonna show in tangent and I'm gonna right click and I'm gonna show out tangent. And what this allows me to do is select the handles on each one of those tangents and drag them out, right? And so I can do that and then get that curve to be a little bit more like a bouncing ball. Like you'd want that to be a little bit of a bell curve at the top. Now, one thing to point out is I've had some people ask me when they select this, they can't select this for some reason, it just stays selected here. What I've realized is it's the move tool settings. And so if you just double click on the move tool right here and you open it up, just reset that tool, close it, and you should be able to select the ends and modify them. So I can move them up and down, right? And I can move them out to change the nature of that curve. So if I do this, I usually want to keep it flat because I want the ball to kind of reach the top and then bounce back down, right? And so I can do that with all the ones that are at the top. I could just, you have to select the key first and then you can drag them out. But the bigger problem are these. So if I start to drag those out, then it just kind of doesn't really work the way I want it to because I want it, I'm just undoing to get it back because this needs to hit it needs to have this bell curve, but it needs to hit and not do this. It doesn't need to curve this way. It just needs to hit and bounce straight, almost straight back up, but still at an angle, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to frame 30. So that's the top. And then frame 15 right there is at the bottom. I'm going to right click on that key and I'm going to go to where it says tangents. And then I'm, you can see it says spline, linear, clamped, stepped, flat, plateau, auto. I'm going to change it to linear. And as soon as you do that, you see that it's changed the nature of the curve where it's linear going in and out. And I'm gonna do that for every one of them where it hits the ground. So I'm gonna to go to linear, then go to this one, right click, tangents, go to linear, go to this one, right click, tangents, go to linear, right? And so each one of them now have tangent handles that go you know, at an angle up, right? Now it's not perfect, you need to fix this, right? You'll have to fix it and you'll have to adjust it. So what I end up doing again is I select that and since it has the in and out tangents and I just sort of drag them this way and you'll see they're kind of start to move a little bit forward. And you, sometimes they, they don't automatically change the uh, nature of the editable motion trail. So you have to kind of move it a little bit and then it'll start adjusting. And you can do that for each one of these, right? So I'm gonna do that for that. And then I can kind of move this around to make sure that that's centered in that uh, you know, in that bounce. And I'm going to select this one and do the same thing, right? And then I'm going to move the ball back here, right? And then I can just hit F on the keyboard and frame that in, right? And I could see the tangent handles a little bit better. Whoop, didn't mean to grab that. Grab that handle, move these in. Notice how they're kind of moving together. And they're based on the tangent handles here too. So if I stretch these out, you'll see that I can get a little bit more of a bounce out of it. And now this one, it has a tangent handle. It's just a little hidden. So usually what I do is I go to that frame and I right click and I go to tangents and I just change it to spline. And you'll notice it kind of pops up. So then I can select that handle and then move it back and I can actually move it up a little bit if I want to get a little bit better curvature out of that, right? Which is the last one would be kind of a nice thing to get sort of an arc out of it. And the same thing here, you're getting kind of nice arcs which is another one of those principles of animation, getting nice arcs out of things, right? And then we've got this path of action going on. Now this one, I need to do the same thing. Go to the first frame, right click tangents, and then change it to linear. And then I can select that handle, grab that handle, and then drag it up. And I'll drag it out a little bit just so I get a nice trajectory out of it. What I usually do when, when, it, when it's at the top, when the ball is bouncing at the top, you can look at those keys when you select those keys and just keep those flat and just kind of pull them out just a little bit. So the same thing goes with this one. I just make sure that I click on it and drag that handle out so I get a nice trajectory coming down. Right? And then I'm gonna select this one, grab that handle, move it in just a little bit, get a little bit better trajectory of that bounce. Right, And now if I play it through, it's not perfect yet. I've got more principles to add and I need to change the timing perhaps, but you can see that I'm, I'm getting it to follow along through each one of these bounces, right? 
And so there's more uh, techniques that I can add to it. And what I'm going to be doing is covering that in another video. But this pretty much gets us to the point where I can, you know, get a nice looking uh, beginning ball bounce, you know, getting a nice path of action, kind of setting up my timing and I can start to adjust the timing. And again, I can hold down shift and just click one of the keys and move it around, right? Right. So that's a, a good way of I, for me to change my timing, right? And so with these handles, if I don't like the trajectory of it, I can just keep kind of moving these handles around a little bit, right? And the idea is if it's, if the handle's on this side, you're going to see that it starts to curve this way. And really the trajectory needs to come sort of start to get straight down. It wouldn't do this. It wouldn't start to come this way, right? So these handles need to be on the inside of these curves or just kind of at that curve itself. So you can kind of see that when I pull it this way, it's, you know, coming down straighter and straighter, right? If I pull it this way, it's coming down, but not at just a straight angle when it hits the ground, which is what it would do. Kind of the idea behind the ball bounce, right? So one thing I do additionally is we're going to start to add squash and stretch. We're going to add some slow in and slow out in the next video. But what I end up doing here is I just sort of modify these, these keys where I like to hold it on the ground just slightly. So if you middle mouse and drag over one frame or multiple frames, notice that the ball doesn't move, right? And so if you left drag, it does move. So what middle mouse and drag does is it holds the position it allows you to reposition the playhead, but keep the object that's being animated right there. So I'm going to middle mouse and drag one over. I want to make sure that I ha have the object selected, the, the ring around the ball in this case, but the, the control itself, because when I have the motion trail selected, you'll see the keys, but I can't key it. I'm key I would be keying the motion trail. So I want to make sure I have this ring selected and I'm going to press S on the keyboard. Then I'm going to go to this frame, middle mouse and drag one over, press S on the keyboard. Go to this frame, middle mouse, one over, S on the keyboard. Go to this one, again, middle mouse and drag, S on the keyboard. And what that's doing is it's going to give you a little stickiness as it hits the ground, right? And we haven't fixed all the timing, but this is going to set us up for when we add squash and stretch and adjust some timing. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. And one last thing I like to do is I like to set up uh, what's called a, uh, a shot camera. So I'm going to create a new camera because this perspective camera is not one that I would be rendering from. This is just to kind of get around my, my scene. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a shot camera. So I'm going to go to up here to create camera and camera. And that's going to create a new camera in my scene. So I'm going to move it back just a little bit and move it up, right? Now I can switch to that camera just by going to Panels, Perspective, and Camera 1. And then if I come over here and I select this, it's going to select the camera. I can see Camera 1, and I'm going to rename that to Shot Camera, and I'm going to take out the 1. If I was making multiple cameras, I could uh, number them, and then that way I can refer to them. And now I can position that camera right where I want to see my entire bouncing ball here. I'm going to kind of set it up, but I don't know exactly where the boundaries of this render are going to be. So what I would, what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the resolution gate. There's a film gate and a resolution gate. So this one is the resolution gate. When you select that, this is what your final eventual render is going to look like. It's framed in the middle of this mask, right? And so I'm going to go to the render settings right now. It's set to, you can see it says 960 by 540. And at the bottom, it says shot camera. So I'm going to scroll to the bottom of this render settings window, and I'm going to change that from HD, it's this half HD, to HD 720 or 1080. These are the HD standards for television, right? So I'm going to choose this lower HD, the 720, and click that close. And you can see it updated 1280 by 720. Now this is going to be setting up for rendering or play blasting. So if I want to always have it from the same angle. Now I've got a camera to play blast or to render from, right? It's always going to remain the same. I could key it and keep it here. That way I don't move it accidentally. So I could just kind of go back and as long as the camera is selected, I just press S on the keyboard and it keys it, right? And so now I can go back to my perspective camera and you can actually see that other camera sitting out here, right? 
but this allows me to kind of move around and always get back to that same camera view so I don't have to, you know, sort of make adjustments to this perspective camera to figure it out. And you never want to key the perspective camera because I want to be able to zoom around the scene. If you keyed it, you know, anytime I moved on the time slider, it'd move back. It would move back to that key. So I don't want to key the perspective camera. It's not the goal of the perspective camera. So this way I can kind of get close into things and I can look at keys and press F on the keyboard and get closer and see what I'm doing with these keys. So I hope that helps. And uh, in the next video, we're going to be adding to this and uh, introducing some more principles of animation to it. So good luck with it.